Okay, so let's remember what we were talking about. Um, the main thing that we did last time, the main thing we did last time was this theorem about how to find the closest uh, uh, element in a subspace of an inner product space to some vector that's outside of the subspace. Okay, so um, recall what we did last time um, was sort of like how to find the closest vector uh, in a subspace uh, S if we have an orthonormal basis of S. If we have an orthonormal basis of S. Okay, so. Um, <coughs> okay, so, um, right, the theorem was this that um, if you have an inner product space and you have um, S. A subspace, okay, and you have um, U1, the UK, and with the normal basis of S, right? Then, if we let, uh -huh, and you have, um, you have some vector B and B. If we let P be um, the linear combination of the UIs, right, I from lambda K, that you get by taking the inner product of B against the UIs, you know, with coefficients that look like this, right, then this P is the closest vector is the closest vector in S two. Okay. Um, and P minus B is in the orthogonal complement of S. Okay. So this is the theorem that we that, that we got last time. Right, that there's an easy way, if you have an orthonormal basis, the point is that if you have an orthonormal <coughs> basis, then it's easy to get the closest vector. Okay. It's easy to get the closest vector. Right, this is sort of like a generalization of the least squares method. Right? We had some way, of getting the least, some way of getting the closest vector. Right? It turns out that if you have an orthonormal basis, it's really easy to get that closest vector. Okay. So the picture is this. Right. You have some, you have some subspace, right? You have some, you have some vector. Oops, some vector P, right? And then you're looking for, you're looking for P, the closest guy in S to B, and it turns out that P is such that um, D minus P is orthogonal to the space. P minus B minus P is orthogonal to the space. And P, P turns out to be this guy here. Okay. And that guy turns out to be the closest one. Okay. So that's your picture. Um, uh, it's probably best to remember that there is no picture, right? There is no picture. That, for example, we could be talking about the space of sounds. Okay? So V is the space of sounds, which we can think of as just functions, functions on, a, on an interval. Okay, and somebody gives you a sound, B. Right, somebody gives you a sound, B. Right, and what this is saying is that if you take, um, right, we have, uh, if we let S be the span of this orthonormal. Thank you. 
cosine a thousand x, say sine a thousand x. Right? If we look at this subspace of sounds spanned by these sine and cosine waves, um, then it's possible to find, using this procedure, it's possible to find the closest sound in this, in this subspace to your original sound. Okay. So you take my, my maybe the um, example used in, in the first class, you take my voice over the next 10 seconds as your, as your, as your vector. Okay. And then it's possible to find the, some linear combination of these guys by taking the dot product, <coughs> taking the inner product, remember how we get it, taking the inner product of my voice against these various functions, and then um, getting the coefficients, and then, and then making some linear combination of these guys. And the theorem says that that's going to be the closest, the closest thing to my, to my, to my, to my, to the sound sample um, in this, in this, in this, in this, with respect to this norm, right? With respect to this norm. Okay. Now, um, like we said last time, in response to Tara's question, that might not be the best sound, actually. Right. It may be that you somehow need to tweak this. You know, it, you know, the fact that this thing is close in with respect to this notion of distance doesn't necessarily mean that, that it's close when you hear it. Right? Like it's, it's, it's mathematically close, but is it actually close in your, in your ears? Um, you may need to change your, change your inner product to, you may need to weight your inner product somehow or change it somehow to make it, <coughs> make it actually more effective for, human, for the human ear. Um, you know, same thing with same thing with images, right? Um, if you approximate it, if you approximate an image using the normal Euclidean distance, you say, oh, this is in Euclidean distance. This is the closest thing to your actual image. It may not be the best thing, right? Maybe like, what the? <laughs> that doesn't look like your image at all, um, right? In fact, um, what I hear is that some people, people actually, for different people, the notion of distance is different. So for some people, you show them a picture and say, which, which of these pictures is closer to the original? And some people will say this one is, and some people will say this one is. And you know, use different, using different norms. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so that's where we, um, uh, that is where we finished up last time, right? Okay. And so, uh, I'm going to try and quickly talk about um, how we can use that to solve the problem of, of creating an orthonormal basis. Okay. So you know the moral of the last couple sections has been that having an orthonormal having an orthonormal basis is great, but what if you don't have an orthonormal basis? Well, fortunately, there's a way of making one. Okay, so there's a way. There's a way to construct an orthonormal basis from a basis. Okay. Somebody gives you a basis. It's possible to create an orthonormal basis out of it. Okay, and this this way is called uh, Gram. Schmidt orthogonalization. Okay. Okay, as I mentioned to the first class, I recently heard this term mentioned in a movie. Um, it was Hidden Figures, uh, that movie about um, mm -hmm. Catherine Johnson, is that right? who was a mathematician for NASA um, for, you know, at the time of the space, space launches, right, the, the, to the moon. Um, like, her, on her first day on the job in the movie, you know, somebody asks her if she had used, she does, she turns in something and the guy says, did you use gram or organization? And she says, yes, of course. Thank you, my Yeah, so, um, okay, so now we'll, we'll tell you what that is. 
Okay, so um, let me lay out the theorem here first, and then I'll sketch out what it what it means. You can probably you understand it when we write it down. So you have V again an inner product space, and you have B B one through B N a basis. Okay. So if somebody gives you a basis, and we're going to make an orthonormal basis out of it. So uh, we can create, we can uh, define recursively an orthonormal basis u1 through un as follows. So the first thing you do is for u1, you take b1 and you divide it by its norm. That's it. So the obvious, the obvious thing to do, you want an orthonormal basis, right? Everything should be norm one, so you make it norm one. Take your first vector, make it norm one. Okay. Okay. Then for U2, U3, U4, etc. Right? We define U K plus one. Uh, I should say actually, sorry, K greater than U one. <coughs> one. Right. For guys afterwards, we define we define the guys afterwards like this. So, like if we're looking at U two. Suppose we want u2. What we do is we take b2, oops, b2, and then we subtract off um, the inner product of b2 on the previous guys. We subtract off the projection of uh, b b you know b k plus one on the previous guys from j equals one to k. Okay, right. Okay, and then remember we want this thing to be norm one, so we divide the whole thing by its norm. Okay, so same thing. Okay, so uh, you guys see what, what this thing is here? Look at this thing, what is this? This is the, Ethan? Uh, it's like a C1 of uh, the coordinate vector. Yeah. Or CI. Yeah, so I mean, uh, with, with respect to, in, in terms of the previous theorem, what is, what is oh, this thing here? Everyone, take a look at the previous theorem. You see that it's p, right? This thing is p, right? So um, what you're doing basically is you're saying, uh, what is this? Um, if we let uh, this is p, it's p, where s is what's what's s? S is the span of U1 through UK, right? S is the span of U1 through UK. Okay, so what we do, what we get is we get this, this thing is gonna be perpendicular to U1 through UK, right? So UK plus one by construction, is perpendicular to U1 through UK, right? And so we get this next guy in the orthonormal basis, 
right? This is telling us how to get the next guy. Well, we make this guy who's perpendicular to everybody who came before, right? You start off with U1, then you get U2, U2 you ensure that it's perpendicular to U1, and you make it sure that it's the right size. Then you get U3, and you, make, you do it in such a way that U3 is perpendicular to U2 and U1, right? And it's the right size. And you keep on going until you've gotten to N. Right. That will that will finish it up for you. Other. What what do you do when K is N? Oh yeah. That's it. You you stop you stop when uh, you stop before you know you stop when K at K equals N minus one, right? Because there's only there's only N vectors to work with. Yeah. Yeah. So for K between one and N minus one. Yeah, we can't we can't keep on going. Yeah. Yeah, Mariah. Um, oh, actually, we're going. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, let me draw a picture. Let me draw a picture that might might be helpful. Okay. So, somebody gives you a bunch of vectors. This, this doesn't contribute much at all, but we'll do it anyway. V1, V2, and V3. OK, somebody gives you a bunch of vectors and says, I, I'd like you to make a, an orthogonal basis out of these, out of these vectors yeah, that has the same span. OK. So you say, OK, well, um, I'm going to let U1, I'm going to take my B1, and I'm just going to shrink it down so it's norm 1. And I'll call that guy U1, right? U1 is going to be V1 over over its norm. And then for U2, you say, okay, um, now I'm going to take my the span of the span of U1. Okay, I'm going to call that S. Okay, right? And then I'm going to take the projection onto that thing. The projection onto that. That's my P. And I'm going to subtract off that from B2. So I take B2 and I subtract off the projection of B2 onto U2. Uh, U1, excuse me. There is no U1. U2. Right? And that will give me something perpendicular to U1. Right? <coughs> that gives me this guy. It's perpendicular to U1. Right? This is uh, B minus P. Right. That gives me something perpendicular to, to U1, right? And then I divide by its norm to make sure that it's it's a norm one. So that gives me um, that gives me this guy here, right? So I get this guy and I get this guy. I get a U1 and U2. Okay. And then. I say, okay, now how do I get U3? Well, U3, I'm going to take you know, U1 and U2 and look at their span, right? And I'm going to take B3. Oh, uh, my B3 isn't, isn't perpendicular to this, so I'm going to make it perpendicular by subtracting off the part that isn't perpendicular. <coughs> so I say, okay, right? I take this projection down to here, right? I get B3 minus uh, B3's projection onto <coughs> this thing spanned by U1 and U2, right? And that gives, by the previous theorem, that gives me something perpendicular to S, right? That gives me something perpendicular to the span of U1 and U2, right? And so I divide by, divide by its norm again, and that gives me, gives me my third factor. Okay. And you just keep on going like this, subtracting off the part that's not perpendicular to the previous guys. Okay. And that's the Gram Schmidt orthogonalization process. Okay, and you can do this in any inner product space. Any inner product space. Doesn't have to be Euclidean space. Right? Good. Whatever inner product space you have, you know, you can uh, if you have a basis of it, you can do a Gram Schmidt orthogonalization to get an orthonormal basis. 
we're, like, we're not going to use this that much, so I'm not going to do much. I'm not going to talk more about it. Um, we'll use it once uh, in the very last uh, topic of the course, uh, singular value decomposition, if we get there. And basically, it'll just be, at one point, we'll say, and we need an orthonormal basis, so we use Gram Schmidt orthonormalization. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's for, that, for that one sentence, is why I did all this work. Right. Um, how do you know that it spans um, S? Well, um, you're, in the end, you're going to have n vectors. Right, um, and they are linearly independent. Mm -hmm. Right, and so you're going to have these n linearly independent vectors oh, that okay. lie in the span of the b's. Okay. Right, and so they will span. They'll span that. They'll span have the same span. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sort of uh, uh, not throwing in all the details, um, but uh, this is all I want to say about it. Yeah, there's, there's one thing that I've kind of slewed over, but if you, you can read about it if you want. It's, and it's not hard. It's not hard. Okay. Let me, let me say what it is. <laughs> so, there's one thing that you might worry about, which is, how do you know that this U2 is not zero? Right? How do you know that, that U2 is, is a non-zero vector? Right? Because in the end, you're going to divide by its norm. Right? It better be a non-zero vector. Right? Um, uh, to get an orthogonal set, all the vectors have to be non-zero. Right? But then you think, okay, well, what would happen if this thing were zero? That would mean, look at this, that remember what u1 is. u1 is b1 over the norm of b1. Right? If this thing were equal to zero, then b2 minus some multiple of b1 would be zero. Right? If, so this is the only thing I slid over. If u2 were zero, then b2 minus some multiple of b1 would be zero, the zero vector, right? But then they would be dependent, right? You have a combination. You have a non-trivial. You have a non-trivial combination of them that gave you the zero vector. But they were a basis. They can't. They can't be. That that can happen. Okay. There. There. I'm on this guy. And, yeah, so every time you step up, you, make, you have to say, well, is u3 not 0? Well, if it were equal to 0, then the first three vectors would be linearly dependent, and so on and so forth. OK. 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 Um, let's go on to, so there's more stuff in, in chapter 5, but let's go, uh, let's go on to chapter 6. So chapter 6. Um, uh, the rest of the stuff in chapter five is basically an approximation of functions. Okay, but I, I think it's more important that we go on to chapter six um, and try to get to the singular value decomposition at the end of the term. So let's let's go. Okay, so eigenvectors and eigenvalues. These are terms that we've introduced before, but now we're really going to go into them. Um, does anybody remember what an eigenvector was or an eigenvalue? Yeah, Mariah, go ahead. Uh, it's like ax equals lambda x. Yeah, yeah. So um, here's the definition. You have some square matrix. Um, if there exists a vector, a non-zero vector, um, uh, such that a times a vector equals lambda times a vector for some for some lambda some some number lambda uh, which could be a complex number. 
So this C means complex numbers. If there exists a vector such that when you hit it with the hit it with the matrix, it just gets scaled by a scalar, then we say lambda is an eigenvalue of a, um, and that uh, v is an eigenvector. Of a with eigenvalue <coughs> Okay. Um, uh, notation, let E sub lambda denote um, the set of all eigenvectors of A with eigenvalue lambda. Say that lambda is an eigen eigenvalue of A, then <coughs> A sub lambda is the collection of all eigenvectors. Okay, um, exercise. Show that E sub lambda is a subspace. Okay. okay. Think about it for one minute and see if you can answer why this thing would be a subspace. There, there's kind of a dull way of thinking about it and a kind of funny way of thinking about it. Why would this thing be a subspace? I'll show you the doorway. I'll show you the doorway. So, um, okay. So you say, well, to show something as a subspace, you need to show two things, right? <coughs> that it's closed under vector addition and closed under scaling multiplication. Right? So you say, okay, let's say that um, uh, U and B are in the space and that alpha is some number. Okay. Is u plus v in the space? Is alpha u in the space? Right, those are the two things we need to show for this to be a subspace. Okay. So what do we need to check to show that this guy is in this? Is in is in the eigenspace. Well, we need to see this is the same thing as saying is a of u plus b equal to lambda times u plus b, right? That's the question. Is it true? Sure, right? Because a times and the answer is yes, right? Because a times u plus b is A times U plus A times B, right? But that's just, just going to be lambda U plus lambda B. That's lambda U plus B.
Okay, everybody all right with that? Everybody all right with that? Okay, right, and then the second one, you do exactly the same way, right? Is Lambda U in, in there? Yeah, it is. Okay, so don't, right? So this thing is a subspace. We call this thing the eigenspace. Eigenspace is just yeah, the dies corresponding to a particular eigenvalue. What's wrong? Yeah, no? okay. okay. Uh, so that is the dull proof. Um, now comes the what I call in my notes the slick proof. Okay. Um, and this wasn't funny until some years ago. Like, like people, now when I say the slick proof, um, people are like, that's kind of a weird thing to say, like the slick proof. But when I was an undergraduate, you know, ages ago, um, the TA of my class at the time always called proofs, you know, you know the, the, there, were this, there was the sort of like the standard proof and then there was the slick proof. And I've always called them slicks and slick. <laughs> Seems like this is some, some sort of like archaic slang or something. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, okay. So uh, we say okay. Well, look. Um, uh, v is in the eigenspace if and only if a b equals lambda v. That's what it means to be in the eigenspace, right? So that's the same thing as saying that AB equals lambda IB. I just throw in the identity matrix. It doesn't do anything. So that's the same thing as saying that A minus lambda I, B, is the zero vector. But that's the same thing as saying that V is in the null space of A minus lambda I. Right? It's in the null space, and right? it gets killed by A minus lambda I. Right? So what does that tell you? The eigenspace E sub lambda is the same thing as the null space of A minus lambda I. Right? So of course it's a subspace. It's the null space of some matrix. Okay? All the null spaces are, are subspaces. So so it's going to be a null. Sp it's going to be a subspace. <coughs> yeah, Connor. Why would you say why we go from lambda v to lambda i v? Well, that's What's just that that's just so that I can make it clear that we have this matrix here. And you could not just be A minus lambda or not? Well, uh, it, it could be, but then what does it mean, like the null space of A minus the number lambda? Uh, okay. Right? We need to have a matrix here to talk about the null space of the matrix. There's this, yeah, yeah, that's the only reason. Um, exercise number two. Uh, lambda is an eigenvalue of A if and only if the determinant of A minus lambda I is zero. Okay. First, let me ask you: What does it mean that the determinant is, is zero? You have a lot of things that are equivalent to this, right? If the determinant of a matrix is zero, then what do you know? Singular. You know it's singular, right? It's non-invertible. So, what else? Anybody? It doesn't have any solution. Doesn't have 
a unique solution to what? To the homogeneous problem yeah. set, right? Right. So this is equivalent to like a minus lambda i being non-invertible. Also equivalent to um, this thing as a non-zero solution. But that's saying that um, uh, V is an eigenvalue, eigenvector. Right? And so that's that's the proof basically, right? You say, well look. Determinant, right? The determinant is zero if and only if um, there's some eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda, right? In other words, there is some B that is an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda. In other words, lambda is an eigenvalue. So zero is never considered like an eigenvalue? Right, right. We don't consider it to be an eigenvalue. Because then it would always, yeah. it would be, in that case, like every number would be an eigenvalue, right, which you don't want. Does that make sense? Are you confused? Mm -hmm. Got questions? OK. So, um, so uh, the above gives us a way of uh, finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And it's like this. Um, say A is a square matrix. Suppose you have a square matrix. Um, and consider lambda as a variable. Consider lambda to be your variable. Okay. We call the determinant of a minus lambda i the characteristic polynomial. Then the roots of this thing, the roots, are the eigenvalues of A. Right? If you have any number such that this is equal to zero, that's going to be an eigenvalue. Right? You're thinking of this thing as a, as a you know, lambda is your variable. Okay. Lambda is your variable. And then you know, if there's some lambda that makes this thing equal to 0, well, that's going to be an eigenvalue. Okay. Let, me, um, let me do an example. So here's a simple example. So A, let A be 6, negative 4, 3, negative 1. Okay. Then we want the characteristic polynomial. 
So we take the determinant of a minus lambda i. Okay. So we take the determinant of we take the determinant of a minus lambda i. Right, lambda i is the matrix lambda zero zero lambda. Okay. Uh, it turns out you work it out. It turns out to be lambda squared minus five lambda plus six, which is lambda minus two lambda minus three. And so you see that it has roots uh, 2 and 3. So you know that A has eigenvalues 2 and 3. So you know that um, there is eigenspaces E2 and E3. Right. Yeah, what is it? Wait, so do um, uh, non-similar matrices have uh, eigenvalues done? Yeah, it doesn't have to do with the singularity of the matrix. Yeah, it could be. So let me, let me, let, I'm sorry, let me, let me go on because there's only a couple minutes to finish. Um, okay, so, so to, get the, um, to get the eigenvalues, right, you take the characteristic polynomial and then you look, for, you look at its roots. Um, and then once you, have the, once you have the eigenvalues, then you say, okay, let's, let's see if we can find the eigenspaces. So remember what these things are. Right? This is the null space of a minus 2i. This thing is the null space of a minus 3i. Okay. So you just need to calculate them. And this is something that we did many times um, in the earlier part of this course. Right? So you take your matrix, right? a minus 2i, well, that's going to be um, 4, negative 4, 3, negative 3. Right, so then you need to um, uh, find the null space, right? So you solve you solve this problem, right? Yeah, come. How do you get four negative four? Because we take this thing and we subtract off two i, right? So you subtract off two zero zero two, right? You get four. Minus four, three, minus three. Okay. Okay. So you say, okay, well, we've got this thing. Um, we just do Gaussian reduction on it, right? You see that these guys are dependent. The second row is going to vanish, right? The second row vanishes. In the first row we multiply by a fourth to get this. Right. So you do, do Gaussian reduction on it, right? And you see that um, that e two, the null space, is going to be the span of one comma one. Okay. Okay. You should you should be nodding your heads, except if you've forgotten how to do how to find the null space. Oh. <laughs> Right, and then the same thing, right, for U3, right, you solve, um, <coughs> you solve for the null space of A minus 3i, right, well, A minus 3i is going to be 3, negative 4, 3, negative 4, right, and so you end up with, one, negative four thirds, zero, zero. Right? And so you see that D3 is going to be the span of four thirds, comma, one. Okay. 
So you find that you find the eigenvalue. So I want to. So you can find the eigenvalues by using the characteristic <coughs> polynomial. Right? Somebody gives you a matrix, you find the eigenvalues by using the characteristic polynomial, and then you use those eigenvalues and just figure out what the null, null spaces are, these things, and you get the eigen, eigenspaces. Right? So these are all the eigenvectors of your matrix. Right? These are all the eigenvectors of your matrix. Right? And in this case, we're kind of, we kind of lucked out. We see that we have <coughs> 1, 1, and 4, 3, 1, right? These guys are both, um, both eigenvectors, and they're linearly independent. So we actually end up with a, uh, a basis, an eigenvector basis, right? So we looked out, in this case, in this case, uh, we got an eigenvector basis. which is something good. You, you remember in chapter four, we kept on saying, if you have an eigenvector basis, then, then it's a good thing. Right? And here, we are able to find an eigenvector basis. Um, you remember, does anyone remember why an eigenvector basis was good? So it has to do with the matrix representation. The matrix representation with respect to an eigenvector basis turns out to be a diagonal matrix. Diagonal matrix. OK, so maybe you've forgotten that. That's OK. We'll, 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 we'll say that again later on. OK, so it's a good thing to have an eigenvector basis. And this is how you would go about finding one. Um, uh, Abel? Would we ever get a? And a matrix A that would have complex roots for the eigenvalue? Uh, could, yeah. <coughs> could. I think, you, yeah, some will occur in the homework. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry to keep you over. That's it for today.